Well, I invite you to turn to Philemon. And as you turn there, uh, it's a privilege to be here and to be in the company of other fellow foot soldiers, as it were. I remind myself that um, any undue sense of expectation can be dismissed. I'm not here to inform you of things you don't know as much as that we could remind each other of things that we shouldn't ever forget. And in turning to Philemon, uh, we uh, come with that sense of anticipation. So let me read uh, the letter. Uh, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion but of your own free will. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, Prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Well, Father, with our Bibles open before us, we pray that the Spirit of God will be our teacher and that beyond the voice of a mere man that we might hear from you, the very living God, uh, to our benefit and to the glory of your Son's name. Amen. Well, we have set ourselves the task. It wasn't assigned to me. I, I did this, therefore I can't blame anyone. Um, of these three studies in Philemon. If you have looked at Philemon at all, you know that it is described variously as one of the special treasures of the New Testament. Um, it's interesting that it should be because it is largely ignored. Um, it is regarded as a, one of the little gems of the Bible and so on. And uh, sandwiched as it is in between uh, Titus and Hebrews, um, it's often the fact that people have missed it completely. I don't know how many of you have done studies in it. Uh, it's largely unheard from the pulpit and pretty well uh, unstudied in the pew. 
Uh, you say to yourself, well, you've set it up wonderfully well for why we would want to listen to three talks uh, from this uh, little gem. Well, uh, hopefully by the time we finish, we'll be agreed that uh, we should study it some more and perhaps try and teach it. You will notice that it is a personal letter, but it's not private. In God's providence, it's been included in the canon of Scripture, and purposefully so. I've chosen to tackle it uh, not because of a peculiar familiarity with this text, but because I would like to have one. Um, I have wrestled with it on my own, and uh, now I'm going to wrestle with it in public. I don't have a good track record in relationship to Philemon. Um, it's certainly less than stellar. I went back through my notes to see if I had preached on it and when. I found one particular talk in January of 1996. Uh, on that occasion, I gave a talk on personal evangelism based on verse 6. The only response that I got was from a member of my congregation who sent me a letter to say, number one, you misunderstood the text, number two, you missed the point, and number three, you confused the congregation. <laughs> That's the kind of encouragement that we all really benefit from. And, and, and what was worse was the fact he was right. Uh, when I went back and reflected on it, I said, yes, I got, it com I got it completely wrong. I should have known better than even to fiddle around with the text, because when I went back further than that, I discovered that the first endeavor that I had with it was at Case Western Reserve University Law School in Cleveland, where they assigned to me Philema. And I should, have, I should have known, because as soon as I finished and there was time for Q&A, the first question posed by a female African-American student was, why did the Apostle Paul not call for the abolition of slavery? And I should have thought that that, that, that was why I was there, uh, and I, I wasn't ready for it, and I made a complete hash of it. And uh, so it's because of this sort of collective sense of enthusiasm that I have for the letter that I thought I would uh, try again uh, with you. I, 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 I begin, actually, in this way, and I'm taking time to begin in this way, and particularly in relation to that, to that comment about slavery, because one of the reasons that the letter is neglected, I think particularly in the context from which I come in the United States, is because the letter is read not through the eyes of first-century Christianity, but is read through the framework of… Um, the American Civil War, or the era of Martin Luther King. And so when it is addressed, it is addressed in such a way that one of two extremes is represented. Either that somebody uses it to say, um, we have to make sure that we maintain the status quo, Paul was not addressing this, and he wouldn't have, and so on. Or on the other hand, it is addressed then as a revolutionary tract. And at the particular time in the United States now where there's an increased emphasis on social justice, then you will find that it is that latter sense of application which is rising to the fore. I would like to mention these things so as to essentially take it off the table in this first address. And I hope that we can agree that slavery is not what Philemon is about that the letter was not written because of that circumstance. You may choose to debate it at coffee time, but I'm suggesting that to you. It is clear that Paul was in absolutely no position to abolish slavery. Um, in fact, what he's addressing here is a microscopic picture. It is a specific instance in a certain context. And if he had endeavored to do so, it would have had very little impact and would doubtless have precipitated uh, the authorities coming down uh, to crush the infant church. Uh, remember that a city of Colossae, at the time of the writing, would have had approximately a third of the population within the framework of servitude and slavery. Uh, not, not slavery, again, in the way in which we have tended to view it or view it now, but if you've read, for example, Robert Harris's trilogy on Cicero, and you have followed that wonderful uh, trilogy, uh, then the picture that is given there that is written through the mouth of Tiro, who is the slave of Cicero, 
uh, I think, sets a far better context for it. And so, uh, we should simply determine that when Paul writes as he does in this way, uh, he's not driven by pragmatism, but he is actually driven by his own theology. And he recognizes in 2 Corinthians 5 that he is an ambassador of the gospel, that the ministry that he has received is a ministry of reconciliation, that an alienated world uh, may be reconciled through the work of Jesus. And now we have been entrusted, he says in 2 Corinthians 5, in order to make that known. And in that context of all kinds of uh, uh, racial, gender, social uh, disruption, he writes uh, to uh, Philemon in this way. Now, um, let's, in, in case you misunderstand me, let's be absolutely clear. Uh, Calvin attributed slavery to original sin. Uh, Calvin said that it is a thing totally against all the order of nature, that human beings fashioned after the image of God should ever be put to such reproach. And we recognize as we sit here this morning that we don't need to go back to the first century in Rome to deal with enslavement that is part and parcel of the world in which each of us live. Oppression, exploitation, human bondage in one form of another or another is represented in all of our ministries. And those concerns and their realistic concerns we believe, I take it, must be dealt with, first of all, in light of the gospel, that it is the gospel that sets us free, and then that freedom is expressed in different ways. And also to say, just finally by way of introduction, what, what cannot be achieved in a fallen world is to be discovered and displayed in the church. What, because, because ultimately these things, in the same way as Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you. That's not a statement about the fact that he doesn't care about the poor. He cares passionately about the poor. He says, this is life in a fallen world. Does that mean that we shouldn't address these issues? No. But what it does mean is that what cannot be achieved within the framework of our world order is supposed to be both taught, preached, discovered, and displayed within the local church so that the barriers that are represented, whether it is in first century Colossae or in 21st century Cleveland, that those barriers of class and race and gender and social status and intellect, all of the things that subdivide people in our world are supposed to then be expressed in a radically different fashion within the framework of the church. And I actually think that when we ask the question, why this letter? Presumably, Paul wrote tons of letters like this. And we know that he wrote all these different letters to the churches, but I can't imagine that he only wrote one personal letter in the, in the course of his time. So that why would this letter then be retained for us in, from, what, a vast body of correspondence? I think it is, at least we could say this, that it provides a specific instance of how in this house church, the unmerited favor of God, which brings sinners to salvation, is on display in the lives of these central characters. So you've got a wealthy homeowner, you've got a once proud Pharisee, and you've got essentially one of the dregs of Roman society. People would look from the outside and say, what possible way would you ever find these three people engaged with one another? And the answer that Paul would give and what the Bible gives is in the gospel itself. If you imagine a, a backdrop, as it were, to this, it, to, if, you, if you laid graphically, if you were doing a, an insert to, um, uh, to a magazine and you wanted to put the text of Philemon on the page, and then the, the, the geniuses who do that kind of thing uh, had a sort of a blurred background. So Philemon would be set on the framework of a blurred background, which would be Colossians 3.11. Here, there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, 
barbarian city, and slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, it seems to me that unless we have that in our minds, then uh, we're in difficulty. So that what is declared, if you like, in that verse in the, in the third chapter of Colossians is then dramatized in a matter of 335 words in the space of 25 verses in this tiny letter. Now, all of that by way of sort of rambling introduction. Now, let's come, and we'll try and get uh, to the, the, the uh, seventh verse uh, before we uh, go, go to coffee, all right? Uh, first of all, the writer, it's straightforward, isn't it? You see him there, Paul. As, as I said, this is, this is an apostolic letter, but it concerns a personal matter. Uh, Paul is writing, if you like, friend to friend, heart to heart. I hope that will come out. He doesn't introduce himself in the usual way. His usual introduction you can find by reading the rest of his letters. Usually he says, I'm Paul, I'm an apostle. He's not being proud when he says that. He's amazed by it, that God would have picked him up and sent him out. And that's how we ought to feel every Saturday night, fearful and amazed that he ever picked us up to send us out. But this time, no, he's introducing himself as a prisoner. Now, I'm taking it that this letter was written along with Ephesians and Colossians while Paul was in custody in Rome. Uh, the other two letters that were written uh, within the framework of the prison uh, are Philippians and 2 Timothy. So you have, if you like, five prison letters. But in only one of those prison letters does he introduce himself in this way, calling himself a prisoner. Now, let me just say uh, parenthetically that this letter is genius on multiple levels. If you are up against something in your church at the moment that you are seeking to, uh, and you're seeking to effect change, then on a very pragmatic level, the way in which Paul goes about this is absolutely terrific. And it is no small thing that he introduces himself as a prisoner when the emphasis is so much on freedom and when he's asking for special privileges. I can't remember who it was, who says, it would be very, very hard to resist this uh, uh, request. It would be very, very hard for Philemon to resist this request, coming as it does from the pen of one who holds the pen in a manacled hand. You know? <laughs> he's scratching out, but he, he doesn't have full movement because he's, he's chained. I am writing to you, he says, as a prisoner. Now, in this way, physically, he's pointing out that although he appears to be at the mercy of Rome, he is in reality the prisoner of Christ. Again, Calvin, quite wonderfully, he says, his chains were the ornaments and badges of the commission he exercised on behalf of Christ. His chains were the ornaments and badges. That made me immediately think of how he ends Galatians. Remember how he ends Galatians? From now on, let no one cause me any trouble. And do you remember how he finishes that? He says, because I'm an apostle, because I've written a lot of letters, because I'm quite significant. No, let no one cause me any trouble because I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. In other words, he says, let me take my jacket off and show you what it is to do what I do. That is his appeal. I appeal to you, Philemon, he says on the strength of the fact that I am a prisoner for Jesus Christ. Timothy is his companion, but in this case, clearly not a co-writer. Now, to whom does he write? Well, you can see it there. He writes to Philemon. Now, let's just deal with this, and you can follow it on, on your own with your own uh, Greek Testament. When he, the, in the majority of the letter, the you is in the singular, all right? He's directing his remarks to Philemon, except in verse 3 and in verse 22 and in verse 25, where the you is plural, at least making it clear to us that although it is a very personal letter, <laughs> there's another element to it in that it would have been read within the hearing of the house church. So that in itself puts, puts the, the, the Bunsen burner a little up behind the bottom 
of Philemon in terms of how is he going to respond to this. He hasn't been able to take it away in his bedroom and read it by himself because he's reading it out. Because it is to you, Philemon, but it is to you, the church, that I am writing to you, singular Philemon. Philemon. He's a dear friend, Agapetos. The ESV uses Agapetos as an adjective, a beloved fellow worker. The ESV, if I remember correctly, has dear friend and fellow worker. I like, the, I like the NIV better in that case. You don't care whether I do or don't, but I just thought I'd let you know. A dear friend and a fellow worker. In other words, and we should never just skip over things like this, Paul sets great value on friendship and partnership. Great value. And so should we. All of us are better together than any one of us is on our own. Always. Now, it is on account of the close personal relationship, which is grounded, you will see, when you allow your eye to scan the text and go to verse 19, which is grounded by implication in Paul's part in Philemon's conversion. He's going to, he's going to come back to this later on, on Thursday for us all being well. And what we realize when we read a letter like this is that there is a tremendous amount of background that the writer, in this case Paul, is not filling in. In other words, there's elements to this that Philemon understood uh, and, and Paul understood. And so, as he addresses him in this way, in terms of being a beloved fellow worker, and as one in whose life he's had the privilege of ministry, uh, we just have to imagine for ourselves. Uh, how was this? Uh, was, uh, did uh, Philemon go on a business trip uh, to Ephesus? Uh, was, he, was he one afternoon attracted by the crowd that went into the lecture hall of Tyrannus? Uh, kind of like uh, St. Helen's Tuesday lunchtime or a Wednesday lunchtime here, and he was coming along uh, Renfield Street, and, and, and somebody said, you know, why do those people go in there in the middle of a Wednesday? That kind of thing. And someone says, well, there's a fellow in here. He's, he's, uh, he used to be a Pharisee, but he's, he's on about Jesus all of the time. I don't know. Philemon perhaps went in in that context. I've got no way of knowing. I like to imagine that he did, was converted, went home, and told Aphia, his wife, how was your trip? I was terrific. You'll never believe what happened to me. I heard this fellow. He told me all about Jesus, and I've become a follower of Jesus. In much the same way that uh, Andrew went and found his brother, remember? And Andrew, in the beginning of John. And Andrew went immediately to find his brother. I, I like to think of him going home in that way, I'd making it all up. And, the, and, and then that he, they have a fellow soldier in their house. I want to believe that Archippus is, is the son. When you read the commentaries, very few decent commentaries, but when you read them, uh, they spend like pages and pages arguing for who this might be. Uh, John Knox argues for the fact that the letter was actually written uh, not to uh, Philemon at all. Um, whoever really cared about John Knox's view on, on Philemon. But anyway, uh, it's, it, it's not worth wasting your afternoon on. I, I just think it's a lovely picture. Uh, Philemon, our, uh, our beloved fellow worker, a good friend and a, and a worker, he, he has a wife who is a sister, and he has a son who is a brother, and he has a home that provides the setting for the gathering of the people of God. What a wonderful picture. And this is where the letter is received. Grace to you and peace from God the Father. Now, this you is plural. This is in verse 3. I remember I told you there's only three places where it's plural. Here it is. When he says grace to you and peace, he extends beyond the realm of Philemon and his immediate household. Grace, it is a charming word, harmonious to the ear. It's a much-used word. And, and unless we're prepared to give to it uh, the framework that the Bible gives to it, we may use it in all kinds of ways that are actually distinctly unhelpful. It's only by grace that Philemon and Paul himself have been brought into a saving knowledge of God. And the peace is the peace which flows from the reception of that grace. So, in other words, the theology 
of just that opening greeting is foundational to all that he's going to go on and say. There is, there is no grace unless God bestows it, and there is no peace unless it flows from the reconciliation that God has provided in Jesus for sinful people. I say that, and I take just a moment on it, because, again, those of us who are familiar with this terminology and use it routinely, uh, sometimes we need to just go out for a while and, and park our car and think about this. What grace is mine, that you who dwelt in endless night called through the night to save my guilty soul. Don't just be talking about grace unless grace silences us, unless grace humbles us, unless grace marks us. There will be no genuine peace amongst our families or our church families apart from the grace of God, which reconciles us to himself and then to one another, so that that peace is that which flows. And Paul, you see, surely he never got beyond this himself when he writes to Timothy. Remember, he says to Timothy, he says, you need to know, Timothy, I'm not hiding anything from you, boy. I was a blasphemer, formerly. I was a persecutor. I was an insolent opponent. But I received mercy, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ overflowed for me. Now, in verses 4 to 7, in the usual pattern of Paul's letters, what you really have then is a bridge between his opening greeting and the focus and the substance of the letter. So he wants Philemon to understand at least three things. Let's just point them out. He says, I want you to know that I'm thankful, that I'm prayerful, that I'm joyful. In other words, quite wonderfully, he's doing what he challenges other people to do. It's always reassuring when the pastor is actually doing what he's exhorting other people to do. You remember when he writes to the Thessalonians, he says, be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Well, wonder of wonders and miracle of miracles, here he is in custody in Rome, and the fantastic thing is he, he's not writing concern about any of those things. This is not some big letter about, could you please come and bring me chocolate chip cookies, and if you could only come, I'm so lonely, and get me out of here, and so on. No, he says, I, I, you're, a, you're a dear brother and a fellow worker, man. I love you, and, uh, and, uh, and I want you to know that I'm really, really thankful. Actually, I think one of the benefits of this little letter is that because of the way it's written and the context in which it's written, it gives us an insight into the Apostle Paul that you don't really get anywhere else. It's, it's written in peculiar terms of endearment. I find it impossible to read this without realizing, you know, he was, he was really skillful, this guy. His legal background helps him in this letter. He was tactful. He's got a real gentle humor, at least, that, that, that comes out. Uh, he, he's genuinely affectionate. In other words, the Paul you meet here is a far cry from the standard picture that you have of the Apostle Paul. I mean, most people just don't like the Apostle Paul. Even people who are supposed to like him don't like him. You know, I like Jesus, but I don't like the Apostle Paul. Well, guess what? The Apostle Paul was a big friend of Jesus. You need to, you get one, you get the other one. But what is striking is that there is no hint here of selfish preoccupation. Despite his unfavorable circumstances, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. Uh, uh, Peterson, in the message, which you're never going to use for study, but it's fun to read. In the message, he translates this. Every Philemon, every time your name comes up in my prayers, I say, oh, thank you, God. Now, you think about some of the people that are on our prayer lists. And every time their name comes up on a prayer, we might be saying, oh, God. But it's not, oh, thank you, God. It's like, oh, God, help me. Now, I remember you. I remember you. Like, I know, I, I know there's, oh yeah, there's Philemon. No, 
That remembering there, which is a word that is used frequently throughout the Bible, actually means something more than simply recollection, as we would understand. It means that when he calls Philemon to mind, he's actually asking God to consider Philemon and to act on behalf of Philemon. When, when, when I write, as I write to you, Philemon, and as you come to my mind, I am always thankful as I remember you in my prayers. Only a few of you, one person in 400,000, knows the name of T.S. Mooney, a little Irishman uh, from Londonderry who was a bank manager and a crusader class leader and a bachelor all the way to his death. And he used to write to me after we had met. He was the chairman of the, of the London Dairy Young People's Convention when he was 73 years old, okay? He gave the lie exclusively to the notion that the only way you can reach young people is by riding a Harley Davidson and getting a leather jacket and wearing sneakers. He wore the same tweed suit, the same funny little tie, had the same haircut and so on, and, and young men loved him with a passion. Uh, for example, caves, uh, the, the well-known cardiac, uh, pediatric cardiologist who died at 39 after playing squash of a massive heart attack, ironically, was one of his boys there and, uh, and did the heart surgery on T.S. Mooney himself. He had, he had around his room in Londonderry, he had pictures. He called, it, he called it his rogues gallery. All these names and faces of boys that had come through his crusader class in 50 years. And he would write to me included me like one untimely born in the list. And he ended his letters always in the same way. I remember you daily at the best place. I remember you. When Mooney died, they found him. His housekeeper found him in his apartment in Londonderry, already dressed, kneeling by his bed, on a floor, when with help, they moved his body back from that position. He had, he had died over his Bible and his prayer sheets. And all the names were there. I remember you. Do you know what an immense thing it is to include somebody before the throne of grace, to pray through the names of our congregation, to actually engage with God for their well-being. You think of what, what this meant as this letter is read. And Philemon says, you know, that is just fantastic. And with thankfulness, I thank God. Prayerfulness. Now, the reason that he is able to thank God is because he says, I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. Love for the saints and faith in Jesus. I say, it's probably a chiastic framework there. You can study it on your own. Now, when I pray for you, I pray specifically, he says. And here you come to the sixth verse. This verse, writes Mu, the New Testament commentator, is universally recognized as the most difficult verse in the letter of Philemon. If you study it at all, you'll know this to be true. I took great encouragement when I, read that, when I read that sentence, because after all, as I've already told you, it was the sixth verse that uh, I employed uh, to my own self-destruction. And if only I'd known that it was the most difficult verse, I might have taken a little more time studying it. It's a reminder to you and to each of us, incidentally, is what Spurgeon says, keep your old sermons to weep over them, to weep over them. Just keep them so you can take them out and look at them and go, goodness gracious, I don't believe I even said that. That is, am that is amazing. Now, so how did I get there? Well, because of the way the ESV, the, the, the way the NIV translates the sixth verse. I don't know if you have an NIV in front of you, but the NIV translates it. I pray that you will be active in sharing your faith so that you may have a greater knowledge of all the good things that are yours in Jesus, which sends you in the direction of personal evangelism of conversational evangelism. Uh, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, that you'll be ready always to give an answer for those who have the, hope, uh, the reason for the hope that is within you. So I read it in the NIV. I say, pray that you be active in sharing your faith. I need to encourage my people to be sharing their faith. Therefore, I'll do it from the sixth verse of Philemon, little knowing that that was wrong. 
sends you in the wrong direction. Well, we're not going to delay on this because this you can uh, deal with on your own. But the key to it here is in this notion of not the sharing, the koinonia, which is this fellowship of your faith, the fellowship of your faith, the fellowship that is the product of your faith in the Lord Jesus. The key, the key idea in this sixth verse is mutual participation in a mutual participation that is proper to your faith. Now, this is of fundamental importance because of what he's, what he's going to go on and ask him to do. My prayer, we might paraphrase it, is that your fellowship with us in our common faith may deepen the understanding of all the blessings that our union with Christ brings. Actually, that's not a paraphrase. That's the New English Bible. I just I have a little red New English Bible, and I just pulled it out and said, I wonder how they translate verse 6. It's a very good translation. My prayer is that your fellowship with us, that is the sharing, your koinonia, with us in our common faith may deepen the understanding of all the blessings that our union with Christ brings. Now, you see what he's doing here. He's, 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 he's magnifying the reality of the mutuality of what it means for him, for Philemon, and for Onesimus in particular, to have been brought into the fellowship of God. That fellowship is now ours with one another. Um, and, and that, again, is where the church uh, is, is able in an increasingly broken world to make an impact. When people come in and they discover, what a strange thing this is. The church, the local church, is one of the few places now where you get people from diverse backgrounds even sitting together, uh, singing together, talking together. It's not a country club. It's not a sports uh, facility. It's, it, it's not an ethnic deal. What is it? Well, it is this fellowship. This faith in Jesus that has brought us into fellowship with one another, and I pray that as you enter into the reality of that, it may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing uh, that you have. Paul, Onesimus, Philemon, and the others are bound together in a mutual bond that leaves no basis for an individualism which robs them and robs us and our brothers and sisters of the experiential knowledge of God's goodness. You see, you see what I mean? That, that it is because I'm sitting next to her, it is because of the coffee time I said, how are you? that he said, well, this week I struggled here or I learned that there. And I walked away saying, now I learned something here. I benefited from something here because that person's not actually like me. I haven't ever really thought about them. You see, the, the, the great thing about Paul in this is there's no sentimentality in it. This is not kumbaya. You know, this is not, this is not uh, Paul, you know, getting together and going, all you need is love. You know, he's not, he's not doing that. It's, enti it's entirely theological. So don't, don't, don't think that I've, you know, swum across the Atlantic Ocean to, get, to give you some of that because I, I absolutely haven't. No, I'm not a great fan of that Bill Gaither stuff over there, you know. I'm so glad that you're part of the family of God stuff, you know. We don't sing that. No, we sing, I'm surprised that you're part of the family of God, right? you know? Because that's far, that's far more honest, right? Because you look around, you go, look at these people. Can you believe it? And we have to stand up in front and listen to them try and sing. If if, how depressing to start a Sunday in this way. Well, let's all stand and sing. Wakey, wakey, come on. Thankful, prayerful, joyful, joyful. I have derived much joy and encouragement. Not a wee bit, but much. I have derived much joy and, in, and comfort or encouragement. And the source of it is your love. Your love. 
which has resulted in the hearts of the saints being refreshed. Your love, notice the endearment again, my brother, we're brothers. I'm the prisoner here of Jesus. Man, you have been terrific. He's setting him up. He is setting him up tactfully, skillfully, but he is moving him. Not in a, not in a duplicitous way. No, in a very gracious, sensible way. He's not going to start off and say something like, Philemon, if you could come and see me, we're going to have a talk because we've got a situation uh, with a fellow called Onesimus, and I want you to take him back. After all, I'm the Apostle Paul. And I, no, 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 no. None of that stuff. No, it's quite masterful. <laughs> and the congregation in his house are looking at Philemon while this is being read out. For I have derived much joy and comfort. They're going, comfort? From Philemon? Are you kidding? My brother, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. And the people are going, is your heart being refreshed? <laughs> well, not lately. Well, apparently a lot of people's hearts being refreshed. Whose hearts are being refreshed? Incidentally, this is, this is where you get into Well, this is when you're glad that you're not using the King James Version, right? You say, why? Because this is the splachna, you know, splagizomai, in the bowels of tender mercy. This is the bowels passage, okay? So he says that everybody's bowels are going well as a result of you. Are you kidding me? Just before coffee time, you mentioned such a thing? No, because the hearts, the hearts, the seat of the emotions, the core of who you are, your inward parts. We understand that. We look at somebody and say, uh, you look at Messi when, when, uh, when, they got, when they got crushed in the second leg, and, and you look after, after Andy Robertson ruffled his hair, and, and, uh, and the great king of, of sport got his head ruffled for him. He never recovered from that. And as you watched him walk off the pitch, he said, you know what? His heart wasn't in it. His heart wasn't in it. We talk about losing heart. And this notion of refreshment in this very word is routine. I rejoice at the, I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus, he writes to the Corinthians, for they refreshed my spirits, and they will refresh your spirits too, 2 Corinthians 7. We rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit had been refreshed by you all. Brother, I'm so thankful for you. I've derived much joy and encouragement and comfort from your love because I see that the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Now, what he's doing is he's about to come to the implications. And so there's a, there's, a, there's a conjunction coming here at the beginning of the next verse. So. Now, we have, to, we have to leave it there. He's paving the way for what's to follow, and we're paving the way for coffee. But at the risk of ending things on a trivial note, I went out uh, earlier this morning to try and find just two packets of sweets. I thought... Um, a group like this, an august group like this, would be, able to, would be able to both understand and handle an illustration such as this. So here is exhibit number one, Smarties. Okay? This is what the church in your leadership does not need. Smarties. Especially they're not smarty pants. I'm not talking about, uh, I'm not talking about um, sanctified scholarship. Now, I'm talking about being a smart aleck. The one to whom God looks is he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at his word. Read the history of the church. And the most erudite and effective and useful, whether you want to go to J.C. Ryle, who I was reading at 2 o'clock in the morning because I couldn't sleep, if you want to go to J.C. Rowell, you, you can deal there with an erudite, uh, vast grasp of theology, a peculiar background in Eton, and so on. But what was the thing that endeared him to the people? It wasn't that he was a smarty. It was that he was a refresher. <laughs> refresher. Take your poison. Pastor Sunso, he's so smart. 
He's so smart, nobody knows what he's talking about. But he thinks he's so smart. She refreshed my heart. I was surprised by it, but greatly helped by it. Philemon, I'm writing to you. You're my man. And the reason I'm so thankful, I'm so prayerful, is because when I think about you, I say, oh God, thanks for Philemon, because through his love, the hearts of the saints are being refreshed. And then having done that, he says, now, let me tell you what I'm on about. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the fact that we can study it on our own and see if these things are so. And uh, we commit now to you uh, the uh, balance of our day and all that is before us. In Christ's name, amen.